Hi everybody, um, I'm Randy Cushing and I live in Hampton and I am um, a legislator and a sponsor of the death penalty repeal bill and have a number of other like, allies here. We're, we're at uh, what I think of as kind of an interesting moment in history here in New Hampshire where after 180 years of um, what we know of or what we used to call the anti-gallows movement and today we call the death penalty, repeal, or abolition movement, New Hampshire seems um, poised to uh, join the rest of the civilized world in repealing the death penalty. Um, we're honored to have in the state at this time um, representatives from the World Coalition Against the Death Penalty who've uh, chosen to have their steering committee meeting here in, of all places, Concord, New Hampshire. Um, 
at kind of an, an opportune moment, and I was glad that some of the members of the steering committee got to be present in the State House this morning when the Judiciary Committee of the New Hampshire Senate voted by a 3 2 margin to recommend passage of House Bill 1170 and repeal of the death penalty. What the, the presence of people from you know, not just out of state but out of the country uh, signals is that the kind of the importance of what's taking place this week in New Hampshire. And by having our friends from around the globe who are also working to, um, you know, to abolish the death penalty in their respective nations and their respective regions of the world, it, it reminds us of the, uh, you know, the need for us to act in solidarity. We want to think about abolition not just beyond, you know, state borders, but around international borders. And um, here in New Hampshire, it's good for us to remember that we're not alone. We're part of uh, something that's much bigger than just the state of New Hampshire, much bigger than the abolition movement in uh, the United States. But we're part of a global movement. And what we do this next week will have an impact, not just on the state of New Hampshire, but it's going to have an impact throughout the globe because it's going to, you know, it's going to inspire other people um, to continue the fight. And I say that not to be, you know, prematurely uh, celebratory, but I'm just cautiously optimistic that uh, a week from today we are going to be marking, you know, the passage by the Senate of a death penalty bill, repeal bill. Um, I want to introduce, we're really lucky to have one of our allies in this uh, fight be Amnesty International. And, um, and I'm sp speaking as, right now as a member of the New Hampshire Coalition to Abolish the Death Penalty Steering Committee, I think that's what it's called, uh, because uh, our, our chair, Barbara Keshen, uh, chose, asked, me, asked me to do it on her behalf. Uh, but I want to welcome everyone here. I want to welcome our guests from the, you know, from, from the world to, from behalf of the New Hampshire Coalition. Um, and I want to welcome, uh, in particular, there's going to have a conversation that's going to be led by a dear old friend, Steve Hawkins, who is now the new, relatively new, executive director of Amnesty International USA. Um, Steve is somebody who, uh, earlier in his career, was a capital defense attorney. He worked for the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. He represented people who were um, facing uh, death penalty, who were condemned to death, and who were executed. Um, and Stephen's kind of a, a hero to me in many ways for that. I also knew Stephen when he was the executive director of the National Coalition to Abolish the Death Penalty, um, and I had the privilege of serving on his board. Um, and I know immediately prior to becoming uh, the leader of the Amnesty International USA. He was at the uh, NAACP as a vice president or something. But Stephen's going to moderate the conversation. He's going to be joined by our friends from the World Coalition. Um, and I'll let Stephen and everybody introduce themselves and we'll go on to this conversation so we can draw our inspiration from, um, from knowing that just as we're doing things in New Hampshire uh, to create a culture that respects uh, human rights, so too our, our allies throughout the globe and you know, solidarity. So good evening everyone. I, uh, I've known Rennie for oh, probably 20 years now going on and I started my work uh, 25 years ago as a young attorney uh, defending people on death row at really at the point in the United States when uh, there were 130, 140 executions uh, a year, and myself and about two dozen other young, fresh out of law school attorneys were just spent all of our all of our weeks and months uh, in Texas and and Georgia and Florida and most of, of the Deep South and, and Alabama. Uh, just stopping ex ex executions. Uh, I quickly realized that 
you know, it was uh, sort of a thrill to be in and out of courts uh, across the country, but, but uh, you know, I quickly realized that, that we would lose. Um, and while I stopped my fair share of executions, I also witnessed my, my, my fair share. And it became uh, readily apparent to me that if we were really going to make any progress, uh, it would not be in any court of law, uh, but really through what we were able to do in terms of winning over hearts and minds. That's what led me to, to, uh, to leave the NAACP Legal Defense Fund and, and the lawyering side and to go to the National Coalition. Uh, during my time as an attorney, it's when I first really came to know the work of Amnesty because coming back uh, into my office after an execution, uh, there would be a stack of letters from citizens around the world um, uh, uh, supporting my, my uh, client, uh, appreciating the work that I did. And it made me realize that, as Rennie was saying, that there was a global struggle at hand. Uh, and it made me begin to think about how I embraced the larger global community in terms of the work. If I had not done that, uh, if I had let the likes of Justice Scalia <laughs> uh, decide how, how I viewed the world and, and, and where my horizon uh, uh, lay as an attorney doing the work, um, uh, my spirit would have been crushed. Right? It, was, it, it was understanding that there was a larger global movement is what sustained me and all the other people who were doing the work at, at, at the time. Uh, Amnesty has been involved for over 30 years uh, in terms of repeal work uh, uh, with respect to the death penalty. Amnesty, as most of you know, uh, was started in 1961 to free prisoners of conscience uh, around the world. But uh, 20 years into Amnesty's time, it took on its first what became thematic issue uh, with respect to the repeal of the death penalty. Why? Because the common threads through so many of the individuals that Amnesty was trying to, to uh, free uh, around the world, the common thread were people being under uh, threat of execution. So Amnesty realized that, uh, that the fight to abolish the death penalty was, was at its core. Um, and so uh, Am Amnesty has been engaged ever since. Uh, but the real heroes tonight are our friends from the World Coalition who have been uh, just doing incredible work uh, towards, uh, towards creating moratoriums around the world. Uh, they just recently, as I understand it now, have 80 countries that have signed what's called the Optional Protocol 2 to, to the International Covenant on Civil Political Rights, which basically uh, uh, binds a country never to, to, to impose the death penalty again. So, so that's, that's a monumental feat uh, and, and one that we should all, all be proud of. Uh, so uh, perhaps we hold the applause until each person introduces themselves and I will start with Kevin from Puerto Rico and then you can pass it on. How's that? It's okay. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Well, I'm Kevin Rivera from the Puerto Rico Bar Association, part of the steering committee of the World Coalition Against Death Penalty. I preside the committee of the penalty of the Puerto Rico Bar Association, and I think that we will uh, present ourselves first and then a little uh, chat. Thank you. I'm Florence uh, Villivier. I chair the coalition. Um, Apart from that, I'm a law professor in Paris, and uh, my organization is the Fédération Internationale des Ligues des Droits de l'Homme. Hello, I'm, um, I'm Guillaume Colin. I'm working for FIACAC, which is a federation of national organizations working on the abolition of torture and death penalty. I'm working as a program officer with FIACAC, and I'm a member of the steering committee of the World Coalition of Death Penalty. Uh, 
Uh, hi, uh, my name is uh, Lin Xingyi and I'm from Taiwan Alliance to End the Death Penalty. And I hope I can say that TADP, we are one of the most active members for, of the World Coalition. And also we are the member of uh, NPEN, it's Anti-Death Penalty Asia Network. Well, please give a uh, uh, welcome. Uh, and we'll all take our seats on stage. So I, I want to start by asking the first question, which is, uh, you know, what, what, in, what inspired the development of, of the World Coalition? And, and, and how do you all see the work uh, of the Coalition Against the, the Death Penalty pro progressing now? And what do you see as, as uh, in store for the future? Whoever is inspired. Yes, sure. Uh, it's the subject of our Sunday meeting, okay, how we see <laughs> uh, evolution of the question, so it's a, it's a big topic. Now, what I can just say is that uh, uh, I, I was a, a member of, uh, one of the um, funding members of the coalition in 2001, so I've seen the evolution of the coalition since then, and um, I was very touched by what Rennie said, it's that uh, it was honored that the coalition uh, came here, uh, but we are honored to be here because uh, I, I think that uh, what is fantastic is to see the, um, the interaction between the local, regional and uh, international uh, level. And for me this morning it was really moving to be there, uh, in, sitting in the room where it happened. But to be honest, I, I didn't understand what happened because it was it was too too quick. Uh, I had I had my notebook and I was about to write, but I didn't understand anything. So uh, so, but it also uh, I also thought that why do people are uh, so why are people so attached to death penalty, whereas death penalty is so easy to cancel. But, I mean, it's in one minute. It's incredible. It was the same in France 30 years ago. It's one minute. But a lot of work behind. And the World Coalition helps to this work behind. It helps uh, to, I, I, I will give details later uh, if you want, but it, give, it helps to give tools. It helps to give methods. It helps to, to create uh, this solidarity movement you were talking about, René, which makes that when once is executed in Texas, in Taiwan, or in Egypt, we are all moved. And, but we are, not only are we moved, we know how to react. Well, we know. We try to react together, uh, and also in a different way, according to the situation. It's a universal movement, but it's also a, a, a movement which respects the differences of the context. Well, as Florence well said, it is a topic of discussion right now uh, about the, how the, the development of the World Coalition. And maybe just to see that more than 150 organizations around the world are committed to the World uh, Coalition. And that actually we have done a lot of work in, this, in these past years. And looking at it uh, from, from the perspective of today, um, I am, I am very proud to be part of it. I am, I am also very, very happy that this week uh, we had two new uh, countries uh, signing that optional protocol, and that one of those countries, uh, we in Puerto Rico, we were uh, actively um, working with. Uh, it was uh, with El Salvador, so and I know that Rennie knows also El Salvador very, very good. Uh, so it, it was, it, it was a moment of, of happiness, of course. Then you have some other news, like, uh, like the execution in, in Texas, and, and you say to yourself, there's a long way to go, but we are getting there. We are getting there. So I want to, to thank 
the people here in New Hampshire for, for having us. Of course, it's a little bit cold outside, but it's very warm here. Uh, not, not only because of, of, the, of the temperature, because, but because of the reception. There's a warm reception. And just being here in the 19th state that will repeal the death penalty, it's, it's, it's one of those happy moments. And it is very important for Puerto Rico as a colony of the United States that each state can be uh, abolishing the death penalty because when we reach that number of 25-ish, then we can also repeal the federal death penalty that is affecting my country in the, in the Caribbean. So maybe later we can talk about the Caribbean, we can still speak about the, the World Coalition Act. TADP Taiwan Alliance to end the death penalty. We were we were formed in two thousand three. Then uh, we we know. Uh, then we went to uh, uh, Montreal to attend the World Second World Congress. Then uh, we learned about that what coalition uh, against the death penalty was uh, uh, was formed. Then we uh, decide to join World Coalition in two thousand seven. I think. And uh, um, I think it's, it's really important for us, for Taiwan, because um, we learn uh, from uh, World Coalition, the member of World Coalition, and also um, we help each other. So, uh, and uh, uh, we were inspired uh, from the member of World Coalition and also World Coalition itself. So, um, uh, I, I think, uh, it's, it's a very important uh, turning point for TADP, we join World Coalition. So, uh, so I want to say uh, thank you. And also, um, um, we invite Renny to Taiwan several times. And uh, um, I'm so happy and I'm so lucky that I can be here in your hometown and to see and to know that uh, uh, New Hampshire is going to abolish the death penalty. It will be the uh, best news. Uh, for me recently, so I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. So, what what would be your your uh, your advice to the citizens in New Hampshire with respect to the to the death penalty? The the legislators, the senators are hearing all sorts of arguments um, from from all sides. Uh, uh, I, I I think the audience would love to hear your your uh, perceptions as individuals uh, from other parts of the world working on behalf of of, uh, of abolition. Maybe uh, you, you. Yeah. yeah. From from my perspective, the um, death penalty that has not turned to tax, basically. So that's what that would be the first argument I would push for. Um, usually, when we're working on this issue, some states are, are telling us that. Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, so uh, for the deterrent effect, some states are telling us that we have to prove that it has no deterrent effect. I mean, the death penalty is a, a penal sanction. So that would be the, the other way around. I think for people who support the death penalty, should have to prove that it has an effect on the criminality, and basically, it does not. Else want to take a crack at that question? I think it, it is very unfair for us <laughs> from outside to, to tell the people of New Hampshire how, how you have to think about it locally. Uh, but well, that's why, why we are here. Uh, we are here to, to share our experiences and of course to, to lobby. To lobby not only in, in the state capital or with, with the people who are making the decision, with the decision, ma decision makers, but also with the people. Um, and and I, I really think that we have to rethink how we are dealing with, uh, with the crime issue. Um, if we are always uh, looking to punishment as one of the ways to deal with crime, then the punishment has to be a right punishment a punishment that has an effect. If not, then 
there's no case about the, the, the punishment. So, so we know that there are numbers that we can crunch and we can think about it. There's also um, a lot of reasoning, um, a lot of moral and ethics uh, reasoning too. It's not only numbers. Um, so just think about it. Be rational. Some, some, some way, sometimes uh, we think about crime and, and we, the first thing that, that, that we think about when, when we know about a, a crime and when we are families of, of the victims of murders, for example, is that we have to act with this, I don't know, the gut feeling of having vengeance and we have to have justice and we, we want a safer place. We don't want another killing, not in the street, not by the state. And that's one of the, the messages that, that we go around, you know, spreading. But my, my message to you is just reason it, study it, look at the facts, look at the numbers, and then do some ethic um, internal reasoning too. Yes, uh, for me, the, what I would say to all citizens of the world is that we, we, the modern evolution of society is to decide that state is the state, individuals is the individuals, and to try to circumvent the power of the state. And the death penalty is one of the rare cases where we accept the power of the state on, on the life of the people. It's, it's something incredible, I mean, and on the... How do you call that? Um, the badge. Badge. <laughs> yes. Badge. <laughs> badge. <laughs> badge. Yes. <laughs> On the badge that uh, you you gave us uh, this morning, I think everything is said. Why wh why should we explain to people who kill people that we are not about we, we are not supposed to kill people and you explain that by killing them i mean it's better say it on the bench okay but it, 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 everything is safe so uh and where i'm really really astonished uh, in united states I, I i've read some books here it's for me it's a mystery because uh, united states is um, is known uh, for its feature of um, suspicion towards the power of the state generally speaking, okay, it's a, it's a generative, it's true. And here, we accept that, we accept that extreme power. I mean, it's, it's a kind of paradox. So that I would say to the citizens. Um, um, uh, how to say? Um, okay. Um, in, 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 a, in, a, in a whole world, a lot of countries, they will say, if we abolish, abolish the death penalty, so how about the victim's family? And uh, uh, we learned from Rani and from United States that uh, you have organization that victims is for abolish the death penalty. But it's, it's not easy for other country like Taiwan or like other Asia countries. So we don't have an NGO that is uh, funded by victim's member, but they uh, oppose the death penalty. So the situation for us is very difficult. But because uh, Rani and uh, some uh, victim's family members came to Taiwan, so we learned from them. Uh, we learned something that uh, although we are not a victim's family, but we need to um, take care of their feeling. So um, although uh, right now we only have a very small working group of the victims, but uh, we learned that we need to uh, take care of them and uh, we need to really uh, talk and dialogue with them. So uh, right now in Taiwan, uh, we start uh, communicate with some uh, victims association, but they for death penalty. But it's still good that we can try to understand each other and we show the face of the death penalty for them. So it's a, it's a small, beginning for us, but I think it's very important. And this is what we learn um, from you. So maybe, um, I know, I think you know better than me, um, 
about the victims, uh, uh, what will they uh, respond for the issue of the anti-death penalty. But for me, I think uh, we should really, you know, uh, listen to them. I think this is very important. Well, I, I opened it up with a couple of questions, but I want to give members of the audience who who have questions for our distinguished guests to have the opportunity to, to ask away. So I'm, I'm going to pass the mic to Cynthia. Anyone? I went to the Senate committee hearing, um, what was it, last week, for, and sat for seven hours and listened to um, district attorneys, judges, lawyers, such renowned people speak about the repeal of this bill. But the people that made the biggest difference to me were the victim advocates. And when I was a young mother, I used to say, and a Betty for Dan coffee clutch of women. <laughs> if anyone ever hurt one of my children, I'd want them dead. I'd want them executed. But I'm 70 now, and I have wisdom. But that part about the victims always was in my head. But there were victim advocates at this committee hearing, and there was not one there that was for capital punishment. There were seven or nine of them. I've forgotten how many stood up and spoke some in detail, some in not detail, about the horrendous thing that happened to their family. And every single one of them was not for capital punishment and saying that this does not help our family, it actually harms our family because it, it gives us more grief. And that very human part meant a lot to me. <coughs> Uh, thank you. Uh, well, Thomas, I'm a member of Veterans for Peace, uh, a group, a national group, and I had actually a part of a letter I wrote to my state senator, who you heard probably today, uh, the chair of the committee, her name is Senator Sharon Carson, and part of my letter says uh, that uh, uh, I oppose the use of a practice which I consider to be archaic, uncivilized, and barbaric. While I can acknowledge your own personal views, I must strongly disagree with them. As a former Roman Catholic, I do know that this religion, as do all religions, vehemently reject its use. Somewhere I remember a saying, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Well, I, I said to her, as a citizen, I don't want elected officials, and this is what somebody just said, I believe, uh, voting to decide who lives and who dies in my name and with my tax dollars. My wife reminded me that you represent all the citizens of your district and not just your own personal views. So, as I understand it, if Senator Susie had been present, and I wrote this two days ago, and she was present today, uh, the Judiciary Committee vote would have been to recommend House Bill 1170 to the full Senate by a 3 to 2 margin. Please reconsider your opposition to repeal of the bill that would end the killing of human beings, even though they may have committed heinous crimes. Well, obviously, she did listen to me because she still voted uh, with the uh, Senator Boone. Now, the other thing I have very briefly is that, uh, Mr. Hawking, uh, you mentioned it, we can't do things unless we change the hearts and minds of people uh, in terms of abolishing the death penalty. I'm wondering, in terms of uh, some countries, in terms of the world coalition, such as China, uh, such as North Korea, uh, maybe Iraq and Iran, uh, without a, a real free press and uh, perhaps an impact of religions there, you know, how do you, how you accomplish that in those countries? I mean, we have a problem here with us, but what about those countries as well? Thank you. Now, uh, your question is very interesting because uh, now at the coalition we are at a time where we are aware that we we must attack the hardcore we we call them the hardcore Iraq Iran China uh, so we we have a, we have a member in Iraq for instance he's always calling 
for our help. He used to be a member of the steering committee until last June. Uh, the very problem is that uh, one of the problems, we, we can't get there for security reasons. Okay, It's obvious. And, and we don't know exactly the situation on the field. So we have first a problem of fa uh, finding facts. Uh, knowing who are our allies, uh, our enemies, and so on and so forth. In Iran, it's different. In Iran, we, we know the facts. We have a lot of members. We have uh, near, uh, members from Iran in our coalition, and we have a great network. It's not a problem of knowing the facts, thanks to these people. It's the problem of uh, the state <laughs> and, uh, and of the applic strict application of the Sharia and also the instrumentalization of the war against drugs, which was very clearly made on, on the, the, uh, this topo. So, yes, and in North Korea, okay, in North Korea, we don't even have images from North Korea. So my organization released a, a, a report on North Korea two months ago, but uh, it was, uh, you know, facts, uh, testimonies, and so it's extremely difficult even to know the situation. So I think it's, it's one a very important thing uh, that uh, uh, before the Secretary General and so on of the um, United Nations, we always say to the states, okay, you, you apply the death penalty, first of all, publish facts. You, you, you have this obligation, it's an internal obligation to say at least what, what's going on. And for the states you are talking about, for Iraq, China, they don't even do that. Um, part of the question uh, was of some of the problems that we can find in some countries about free press or religion and I don't know a religion that says that you have to kill but I know that some people use the religion uh, as, a, as a shield against not only religion but sovereignty uh, and some other excuses uh, to to go with with this human right life, uh, but there are a lot of things that you can do when you don't have those tools. You have academics, you have grassroots uh, grassroots movements, you have other countries in the region that can form, as in Asia, as in the Caribbean, that can form regional coalitions to begin with this. Uh, movement against capital punishment, and I wanna I wanna have a point in in terms of the Caribbean because this year uh, was dedicated to fighting the capital punishment in, in the Caribbean region. Caribbean region, uh, the Greater Caribbean region, uh, has like twenty something countries, twenty five twenty five ish uh, countries in in the whole region. Um, you can separate in terms of cultural and if you see the, the numbers of the, of the countries that had the capital punishment and those who have not, who have the, have not the, the capital punishment in their laws, it's uh, most of the countries that has a capital punishment are the, it's the English speaking uh, Caribbean versus the Spanish speaking Caribbean. Um, I know that there are a couple of countries in the Spanish speaking Caribbean that still have the, the capital punishment in law, but they are not applying it. Um, you can speak about Cuba. The, the last execution in Cuba was in 2003, and there are more than 10 years that they don't apply executions, they don't have um, death penalty sentences. Uh, actually, they don't have no, they have no one in death row right now. And there have been some expressions of, actually from Fidel Castro, the ex-president, uh, against the capital punishment in these recent years. So there is space in, in, this, uh, in these countries that retain capital punishment in the Spanish-speaking Caribbean. In the English-speaking Caribbean, we have another problem. When we go to the moratorium vote in the UN, these are um, new countries, most of them countries that were formed in the 50s, the 60s, the 70s. And a lot of them are reacting to London and they are saying, hey, we are sovereign states right now. We have a high crime rate and 
we think that one of the ways to deal with the crime, in terms especially with homicide, it's having the death penalty. And as a block of countries, they are supporting each other in this moratorium vote. And when you see the, the votes against the moratorium of the death penalty in the world, 25% of those votes are from this Caribbean region. We don't have a lot of executions, actually. We, we haven't had executions in, in the last five or six years uh, because there are a lot of lawyers who are fighting uh, these cases uh, in the Privy Council. Actually, that's the highest court of a lot of English-speaking Caribbean countries in London, the Privy Council. Uh, so you, you can see how, how this colonial past is still affecting uh, laws in the, in the and, and of course the death penalty in the Caribbean region. But we have formed this regional coalition and we are working there with the help of the World Coalition Against Death Penalty and Amnesty International. This past year we were in Trinidad and Tobago, we were in Grenada, we were in Jamaica, Some of, what, which other countries? Of course in Puerto Rico. And right now we have this regional coalition with the Secretariat in Puerto Rico that are working. These people are working. Each month they are speaking with, with each other. How are we going to go through with this struggle in the region? And we are going to have the next meeting uh, of, the, of, of, the, of the working group in the Caribbean in San Juan when we will, we will be in the General Assembly of the World Coalition that is going to take place in June 20 to 22 in San Juan, Puerto Rico. So, uh, this is an invitation for you to come to San Juan. It's, it's beautiful. The weather, it's, it's, it's the same like here, you know. It's <laughs> I know that Maria was telling me that she wanted to go to this beach and that it's, uh, it's ranked number three in the world in, in flamenco. It's flamenco in Culebra. So, we can also... <laughs> go to the beach when we are fighting death penalty. So, yeah, why not? Uh, so, uh, this, this, this year has been dedicated to, to the Caribbean, and it's for a reason. Not only because of the moratorium vote, but because of crime rates. Um, it's, it's one of, I think it's the more violent region in the world. If you, if you don't look, of course, uh, regions that are at, at war, uh, the Caribbean region is, is, is the most violent region in the world. And there are a lot of, of, uh, of ways to deal with crime. And of course, having death penalty hasn't worked in the, in the Caribbean as, as in the rest of the world. So we are tackling the crime issue uh, that is, it is related to drugs, drug trafficking. It is part of the, of the bridge between the producing, some of the producing countries and, and the demanding countries, not only the United States, but also uh, in, in Europe, especially uh, the UK. Uh, so we are tackling that, that, that other issue of crime because we cannot let the state kill, but we don't want people killing in the street either. So, so we are, that's, that's part of, of what we are here for, you know, that it, it is a joint struggle that we have to, to make for a better society. Uh, Mark Parker, I'm, uh, I guess amongst other things, uh, the clerk of the support committee for the New Hampshire program of the American Friends Service Committee. I'm also a dual national, British and American. And my worry is, even if we do, and I'm hopeful that we will, pass the repeal of the death penalty here, is complacency. I noticed that in the presentation, uh, there are a number of states that have reinstated the death penalty and, even, and tried to hide it. In Britain, uh, I don't think there's a risk of uh, imposing the death penalty again, but if you poll the population, they, the majority of the population supports the death penalty. Once we get rid of it, 
And I, I was complacent in this country when the Supreme Court got rid of the death penalty, I thought. Uh, and I thought that, well, didn't need to do anything. What are we going to do to make sure the death penalty stays repealed? that some states have reintroduced the death penalty, but they haven't legally abolished. I mean, they, they had a moratorium. I mean, thinking about Nigeria, which was presented as an example, which reintroduced the death penalty in 2013. They had a moratorium for seven years, but they didn't repeal the death penalty from its legislation. And uh, then when the death penalty has been abolished in the legislation, the, the security which can be introduced is the ratification of the second optional protocol to the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which basically is the safeguard in favor, in order not to introduce the death penalty. Can I respond for the previous question? Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, Taiwan and China, we are two different independent countries. But I can still say something about China. Um, I, I want to give two examples. Um, uh, two years ago, uh, you know, uh, EU, they have a lot of projects in China for the human rights issue, and, and especially for the death penalty issue in China, they have a lot of projects. But uh, you can see that they support the professors to do the research. So in China, they can do a lot of research in abolish the, the death penalty, but only in the academic level. But uh, two years ago, a professor from China, they, he visits Taiwan, and he come to me, and he asked me uh, about the question how we do the uh, movement of the uh, abolish of the death penalty because they, he said that uh, EU give them money but they are not satisfied with all the research, all the academic level uh, events. They want to see if they can do something to the public. So the professor, they, they need to uh, find a way to do the public awareness instead of only research. So I think um, this is a way. Another example is um, we, um, we have uh, um, contact with the uh, Chinese uh, human rights lawyers. And uh, um, although the situation for them is very difficult, it's difficult but they still try hard to uh, do something to abolish the death penalty, especially for uh, to uh, uh, defense for the uh, people who face the death sentence. And what they do what they uh, do right now is they gather together. They help each other uh, with the case. So um, you can see that if there is a death um, penalty case, they can call different uh, lawyers, work together to uh, help each other. And uh, um, they can also visit Taiwan too, <laughs> and uh, we have uh, we have the um, uh, how we have the uh, event to exchange experience about this. So I think although China is a very is the most difficult um, country in the world, and they have the high highest execution numbers, but still we uh, we have a chance to um, to uh, how to say help them to um, you know, exchange uh, experience to, to them. And I think uh, for the human rights lawyers in China, um, because sometimes they, they, they are invited to Europe, or I, I don't know if they are invited to the uh, to United States, but I think this is very uh, good uh, for them, because in, in China they are isolated, but if uh, sometimes they cannot, um, the, the government will not allow them to go, go abroad, but sometimes they will. So I think if uh, we can uh, try to invite them to uh, other countries and uh, exchange experience with others, 
and give them some support. I think this is very important uh, for them. So maybe uh, New Hampshire can invite some you know, Chinese human rights lawyer to here to uh, encourage them. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Just a little, uh, little answer to, to, the, to the question of what to do next. Uh, Yon uh, spoke about the, the second option on protocol, but there are a lot of things that we have to do uh, when we abolish the death penalty. First of all, we have to keep the issue in terms of the discussion of human rights. Then we can make this topic uh, be treated as a topic of slavery, for example. We ban slavery and we don't have that traditional slavery right now. Yes, we have human trafficking and maybe we can uh, feel that we are slaves or of our work or something like that, but we don't have that kind of slavery. So I know that, that we can do the same with, with this topic of, of death penalty. There are ways to, to do it, uh, keep with the, the research, uh, keep uh, speaking about it. Uh, we, we, have to, we have to remember what happened, what is happening, and what do we want to, to happen in the future uh, for the future generations. And then I give you the floor there. And then it becomes, uh, in France it was very recently that we uh, get rid, got rid of the death penalty, it was in 81. Now, there are some people who are in favor of death penalty in France, but it's a matter of personal opinion, that's all. It's, it's no more a matter of politics. I'd like to know a little bit more about how it came to pass that European pharmaceutical companies have begun to refuse to sell drugs necessary to conduct executions in our country, and if you had any influence on that at all, or whether that was just a corporate decision on their part. Uh, well, several members of the World Coalition were actually very instrumental uh, in working with the uh, manufacturers, or I wouldn't say working with to begin with, to actually convince them that they had to stop. And they had, they did not want them, to, we did not want them to remove these products from the medical field because that hinders professionals. And that was a major problem when the uh, sodium theopental was actually no longer available at all because it was an American manufacturer, but it was using uh, a factory, a very modern factory in Italy, because this, you have to understand that these products have a very small profit margins. So for this lab, which is Hospria, having it done in Italy was making it worthwhile. But the Italian government stepped in very quickly because there was a lot of lobbying through parliamentary NGOs, and they said, okay, you can manufacture this in our land, but on one condition, you are legally responsible it must never, never be used for human executions. And Hospia realized that they didn't want to get into that. They said, okay, we're not going to distribute it anymore. Then a number of cardiologists and surgeons really were very upset because they needed this particular product. So when the issue came up for the uh, pentobarbital, uh, I mean, there are many ways for manufacturers to distribute their products in the United States through a, distri a controlled distribution system to ensure it doesn't go to the Department of Corrections. So the problem came up with the Danish laboratory, and quite honestly, they did not care, clearly did not care that its product was being used for execution. What they were worried about, that we did a lot of lobbying on the shareholders associations. They lost a lot of money on the stock exchange. Uh, the shareholders saying, we don't want anything to do with this. We're selling our shares. So they said, okay. We'll, set, we'll put up that control distribution system. And since then, the organization in question, which is Reprieve in London, lobbied a lot of the American lab, uh, pharmaceutical laboratories to sign a sort of a contract on ethics so that they would, you know, commit to not sell any, any products because they will come up with new ideas. Believe me, we haven't seen the end of that one. And, but today, the problem is an American problem because it's with compounding pharmacies.
and we come from Europe, we can't do anything. So the European Union added to a list of products that are forbidden for exports as a product for t used for torture or lethal, lethal injection products. So that sort of locked, there was another lock. Germany did take also some specific legislation, so did Britain. So, you know, it's locking up around, but now the work really needs to be done in America. And I'm sorry to say that it is not done on a nationwide level, and it's really, really urgent. I hope this doesn't come across as naive, because I don't mean it to, but I'm aware that when President Obama was running for president, and when he was a state senator, he was instrumental, and correct me if I'm wrong, in the moratorium on the death penalty in Illinois. Um, I get the politics that he faces today. Um, I'm just wondering if there is a glimmer of hope, um, knowing that he played that role um, at some point for the U.S., and what your take on that might be for federal uh, death penalty issues. And that probably is a bit naive. Me. I, I think that, that, you know, that then state Senator Obama played, you know, uh, a minor role. I mean, he, he, he joined in the effort, but I, I don't think he, he, he led the effort in any way. And some of us who were involved back then uh, trying to bring about the, the moratorium in Illinois knew who were the, 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 the key Senate senators at the time. So. So it's, it's, it, it, it's not surprising to me that, that the president has been quiet by it on it. What we do see, though, in, in terms of where the federal death penalty lies is, is that there hasn't been, um, you know, I get on thin ice here because some of my colleagues may, may have better intelligence than I, but, but uh, while, while there are people still going to to the road there. There have not been efforts that I remember like a decade ago really struggling to stop some of the uh, very, you know, real movement towards that federal execution. So so the, the federal death penalty is sort of in the same area of sort of limbo that that, that we find several, several of, of the states at this point. I, I don't want to, to, raise, to raise a question though for you know, and it, and it goes to how we'd love to perhaps compound farm pharmacies. You know, what is the role of, of a larger youth movement um, that connects with social media? How do, um, how do we begin to, uh, you know, use some of the new modern tools that frankly weren't around when I was, you know, doing work 25 years ago that, that, that we have now? And, and if, if you all were to give me advice as the executive director of Amnesty about how to use sort of our social media department, what, what, what would that be? Hello. Um, so I think that Florence... Uh, this, this, this. Yeah. Okay. I'm tired. Um, so jet lag is... It's killing me, but <laughs> so um, I think Florence is it called me to answer to this question because I'm a member of the staff of the World Coalition. I'm not the person who's following directly social media. She's not here today, but um, so what we do with social media, we started working with it like um, maybe three years ago, more intensively. Um, what we have been trying to do is that to use our platform, so our Twitter and our Facebook, to um, promote what the members are doing. So we are retweeting, we are posting on our Facebook everything that our members uh, tweet and put on Facebook, so they will get a better visibility because our pages are followed by large, large numbers of, um, of people and we try to do that in several languages to give access to um, to uh, the widest public as possible. And another thing that we do, uh, that we use social media, especially at the specific time of the year, which is World Day, 
World Day Against the Death Penalty is the 10th of October of every year. It was created by the World Coalition. It's been recognized as a uh, um, European Day Against the Death Penalty. It will probably be recognized as the African Day Against the Death Penalty. Maybe one day we'll have it also as the American Day Against the Death Penalty. And during that time of the year, we encourage members, our activists and the wider audience to organize events. And uh, uh, social media, it's very important at that time because uh, we ask people to RSVP to events, we ask people to use our um, pages to advertise what they're doing. And that, um, and that increased the size of events organized every year. And uh, another side which is of, that is important uh, um, of social media is blogging. Since uh, blogging became more common, we um, realized that there is a better coverage of what's happening on World Day. Um, we all always do um, sort of media review of uh, all the articles covering World Day uh, around the first like 10 days, 15 days of October. And we felt that uh, um, in hardcore countries, as France was saying, like China, Iran, Iraq a little bit less, but a lot of the news are passing through the people through blogging. So uh, we try to follow um, what's happening in different blogs, in different languages. It's not always easy because we don't speak all the languages of the world, but we have members that do. So we use, for example, Chini to translate in, from Chinese. We, we, we have members from Iran that help us with the Farsi, and we, we try to follow the news and I think that's the best thing of so that social media can do. It gives us access to countries where we can go physically so we can be there through technology. That's, I think that's the best use we can do of that and then to, to advertise our campaigns and petitions. Petitions never don't work very well but uh, it's a good way to, to spread what we're doing and to also mobilize people. I think it's the best way to use them. I want to tell you a secret, but please don't tell to Taiwanese. Um, um, we, um, if we use our name Taiwan Alliance to end the death penalty, then a lot of Taiwanese they will, you know, they will think nothing but against us. So uh, we right now we have two uh, uh, Facebook uh, pages, and one is TADP. They know it's TADP. But the other one, we call it Death Penalty Forum. We put something like facts only. But we, uh, uh, we leave some uh, question. It's very, you know, it's not that anti-death penalty question. So it's open to the audience. And they, they can discuss in that pages too, because they don't know who, who, who are they. So we only say Death Penalty Forum. So it's very interesting that we can uh, really discuss questions in that uh, pages. And also in, uh, in Death Penalty Forum, we, uh, we uh, invite some um, law school uh, students. They attend the court hearing to write down some observation of the uh, court hearing. And uh, um, it shows a lot of ridiculous things happened in the court uh, with the death penalty cases. And, uh, and it ha helps because people think that all uh, judges and prosecutors will uh, very, um, just, uh, will, when they trial a death penalty case, they will be very carefully, but in, in, in truth, it's not. So the uh, observation of the court hearing, uh, they write down very details and uh, I think it helps, it helps us to uh, uh, face some uh, very uh, difficult uh, cases in Taiwan. So, it's a secret. <laughs> Don't tell Taiwanese, otherwise they will know it's TADP. So, that's serious. Yeah, thank you. We have time for one or two more questions.
I actually don't have a question. I was going to make a comment about the social media use of things. Um, I am currently a hall director at the University of New Hampshire in Durham, and this is something that we're kind of working with a lot in terms of how to best utilize social media to kind of get our message across, if you will. Um, and I think a lot of what was said is kind of the issue with how we use social media, especially the way that students and young people are using them now, and obviously that's who we want to engage. So I think creating a space for people to actually have discussion around this versus this is what we're doing, sign our petition, all this kind of stuff, that doesn't work. That's not what people are using that for. And so it's more about creating a discussion that then catches fire because people are talking about it. And, you know, I'm actually tweeting about some of the stuff that I'm hearing here. And, you know, I think retweeting some of that stuff will be helpful, creating some hashtags that people can relate to um, Facebook, I think, is losing its traction among young users, and so Twitter and Vine and other kind of newer forms of social media will be the way to go with that. So that was just kind of my opinion with that. One more question. Yeah, I think that that would be the perfect use for it. Uh, the, the, the thing is that most of the time NGOs don't have a lot of resources, so the, the best use for us is to do is to give visibility to members that actually do that. So we, uh, the World Coalition is, was born and its main role is, its main role is to provide um, visibility to members, provide them with tools. So what we do is we use our uh, visibility for them. So we retweet what would they do, and then, and then we use it also, as you were saying, as I said, for to, to, to publicize events and to publicize what we're doing. I think that on a personal level, several members of the World Coalition will, are using their Facebook page, their Twitter account, to do what you're doing. For example, Sandrine, uh, Elizabeth Zitrin, that I don't see here, where she, she's not there, they, they're like very active and they, they do like uh, create a discussion and they talk with their friends. For example, yesterday I took a picture of myself with the badge and all my friends were asking me what I was doing and I put it on Facebook, on my personal Facebook, and everybody, my friends were asking me what I was doing and what was this what the, the, the pain was about, where I was, so then I can do it on my personal Facebook, but for an organization it's a little bit more difficult to, to moderate such kind of discussion unless you have a lot of resources and you have one person dedicated to that. So for us it's mainly give power to our members, give visibility to our members. It would be great if we could do that, <laughs> what you're suggesting, but for now it's impossible. I just wanted to, to go back to the previous discussion because I, I'm not very good at uh, social media. Uh, about the, um, what, what you were saying been about uh, the fact that uh, in uh, many uh, countries of the greater Caribbean, death penalty was, um, um, has been installed by the, the, the colonial, in the colonial time. And then now is a, a, a political subject uh, for against uh, colony. It's the same in uh, in uh, Africa. Uh, so I, I, I wanted to, to to give the floor to to Guillaume for on that point because the, the parallel is extremely interesting. So I will give you the floor in one minute. But before that, I wanted to say also you stressed the role of the of the of the lawyers of the bars and. Um, we have here in the room uh, the representative of the Paris Bar. It's extremely important, the role of the bars. And uh, during the Congress in Madrid, the, the last Congress in Madrid, uh, we were, Anne and I, very um, um, shocked uh, by the fact that in the US, uh, uh, the US Bar d didn't have any position uh, for, uh, uh, for the abolition. The same in Japan, for instance. So even this very powerful professional organization don't have the courage to have a position on that topic. And I think it's extremely uh, sad. Thank you. 
Yeah, it's, true, it's true that what you said on, on the, the Caribbean, we can really see the same thing in Africa. Um, I mean, you said that uh, most of the uh, English-speaking Caribbean countries still man maintain the death penalty, whereas Spanish-speaking countries have moratorium. And it's the same thing in Africa, where that basically uh, Portuguese-speaking countries have all abolished the death penalty. French-speaking countries have abolished or are in a moratorium situation. And most of uh, English-speaking countries still maintain the death penalty. And there is only one Spanish-speaking country in Africa, which basically uh, still maintain the death penalty, still has the death penalty in its bill and still use it, which is um, Equatorial Guinea. But, uh, and most of the African countries, the, and above all the English-speaking ones, um, I mean, there, were, there was no death, almost no death penalty in Africa before the colonial period, and uh, it has been introduced by the colonial um, powers, by France, by, by the UK, and now uh, people are voicing out that they maintain this penalty in order to protect their, their sovereignty, exactly what you say for the, the Caribbean. It's really, inter really interesting. And to, to come back to what um, Mr. said, um, what, one strategy which has been developed by, on the African continent uh, in order to reach the abolition is to, to put together people in favor of the abolition and above all uh, media religious leaders and community leaders and to have them on board in order to voice to, to give their voice in favor of the abolition and to reach the, the, the abolition at the continental level. And that's a strategy which has been developed by the African Commission on Human and People's Rights, which is the, the African Union Bodies for the Protection of Human Rights. So that's really interesting. I wanted to, to make a couple of comments. It has to deal with the United States. Uh, first of all, uh, organizations, lawyers' organizations. Uh, there are very different lawyers' organizations in, in the states. Uh, and you have like the very progressive ones, like the National Lawyers Guild. They are against death penalty officially, but of course, it, it's not as we are um, uh, as we know the bar associations, uh, because they, they are more maybe more private uh, organizations. You have like the American Bar Association that they have forms of discussions, but maybe not a, a formal position. And you have like uh, the other one is the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers. I think they have a position against death penalty, at least the Puerto Rico chapter. Uh, there's a Puerto Rico chapter they, that it's associated with with the uh, with uh, the criminal uh, lawyers uh, defense, but they they are against death penalty. So it's it's it. it I, I know, but maybe there are some organizations, right? The American Bar Association has, has, has no official position. Uh, in terms of federal uh, death penalty, I think that the topic uh, it's it's been like the fight has been slowed down a little bit because it's not right now in terms of numbers like like the the main goal uh, in terms of executions. Um, but of course, there are other things that that can affect that. First of all. Uh, you need U.S. Congress to act, and the U.S. Congress is a little bit more conservative than uh, state legislatures uh, in general terms. It's not always like that, but in general terms, uh, you can you can see more conservative Congress in, in terms of the members than in the, than in the state legislatures. So it's easier to have a change in the state than in the, the U.S. Congress. And of course, like the National Coalition Against the Death Penalty, they are, they are going, like, in, uh, adding uh, states in, in t towards the abolition. So then we can go to Congress uh, to ban, uh, finally, the, the death penalty. In these last years, there have been very little uh, success you know, in, in terms of, of affecting the federal death penalty. One of those uh, came from Congress, men and Congress women, that ask uh, Holder, Secretary of Justice, to take into account that there were jurisdictions in the United States who abolished the death penalty, and uh, they were asking Holder not to apply the federal death penalty in those jurisdictions. Uh, what Holder did was that uh, he added, uh, when they, were, they are evaluating a case uh, for capital punishment, they added that as one of the evaluation points to see if they were going to to uh, to trial the case as a capital punishment case or not, 
Uh, but it, actually, I, I know that the federal government has not actively uh, been tra trying cases for capital punishment in some jurisdictions. In my jurisdiction, in, in Puerto Rico, they have been actively doing it. Uh, so people were asking me why, uh, as a colony, it's part of the power, uh, you know, relationship. Uh, we have to make the statement that we are here and this is the law that we are applying. But there are some other things that are, are working uh, nationally in Puerto Rico. We have a MOU, a Memorandum of Understanding, with the federal government, where some of the uh, cases that were traditionally tried at a state level are now tried at the federal level. Uh, because of resources, and and what what we have seen is that we were we had like maybe one capital punishment case each five to six years in the federal court. Right now, in the past year in six in six months, we have like four to five uh, death penalty cases, uh, and of course a lot of struggle in the streets and consistently the jury. Uh, 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 sentence those people have found them guilty, but no one has faced the death penalty in that death penalty phase. So it's been a lot of struggle there in, in the street, and we are we're getting there. We're getting there. Great, thank, thank you. Reminds me. Reminds me of the struggle we were facing a decade ago in Washington, right. D.C., or 15 years ago. Well, thank thank this panel, and thank. You audience and uh, please welcome me and or, or welcome me in joining and giving them a warm welcome. Just to, to second Stevens uh, welcome and thank you for being here. Uh, I'm Arnie Alpert. I'm the New Hampshire director for the American Friends Service Committee which is a member group of the World Coalition. So uh, it's really an honor for me for you to be here with us uh, for this weekend and to help us make some progress, but also to remind us that the eyes of the world are on New Hampshire. Now, I'm also on the board of the New Hampshire Coalition to Abolish the Death Penalty. And in that role, I want to tell you that we have seven days left before a very crucial vote. And there's things that all of us can do. We can be in touch with our own senator. We can make sure that everybody we know is in touch with our own senator. And if you feel like your senator has already heard as much from you as that senator wants, um, you can talk to Susie and John Michael about signing up to be part of phone banks over the next week to call other people in New Hampshire who uh, may not yet have contacted their senator. All of this education that we're doing, reaching hearts and minds, is extremely important. Um, doing that plus calling your senator, writing them a letter, dropping by their office, visiting them, letting them know that this matters to you and all the reasons why is what we need to do in the next seven days. Now on next Thursday, we will also have a presence at the State House, starting with vigils, uh, outside at around 8.30 or 9 a.m. It happens to be Holy Thursday, a significant date in the calendar of the Christian churches, uh, and their New Hampshire Council of Churches is convening a prayer vigil which will be taking place outside the State House. Some of us may choose to participate in that. Some of us may choose to participate in more secular activities, but the more people we have there to greet the senators when they arrive, the more impact we have. The Senate will go into session at 10 a.m. They will not take this up right away. Uh, some of us will probably stay there throughout the day, but having people there in the gallery at the time that this vote takes place, having people in the lobby, that's why they call it lobbying, so that we can chat with senators when they come in and out um, is very helpful. We want to remind them, again, that people have their eye on this and that this is a very important thing and that this matters to a lot of people and that the eyes of the world uh, will, be, will be on New Hampshire. Sometimes people in New Hampshire think that we are apart from the world. We know that there are people who have come here from all over the world, in many cases fleeing from violence in their own countries. Uh, there are other people who are aware that there is a world beyond our own borders 
uh, and that we are part of a global community. So I appreciate Randy's comments about global solidarity, that we are part of a worldwide social movement, and we've got some moving to do in the next week. The final thing I want to say now as a member of the Red River Theater <laughs> is to thank the theater for having us here and to let you know that they have a film being shown in this very room starting in a few minutes. So they would like us to leave uh, and they would like us to actually head over to the far end of the lobby if we want to continue to hang out because there will be people enjoying the next film. Thank you everybody for coming. <laughs>